this is what happened. I'll tell I was there that night, so I'll tell you what happened. Welcome back to the 85 Grave Show. Tonight, as part two of our Death of Razzle episode, we travel to Georgia for an interview of anchorman Jim Thomas, who in addition to being Vince Neal's good friend and neighbor in 1984, was also present the night of the party that preceded the fateful accident which permanently placed both Razzle and Vince into the dark side of rock and roll history. First, a brief in-studio discussion about new information in response to comments from part one of this episode, then our visit to the home of Jim Thomas for the exclusive bombshell interview, which also includes never-before-seen photos and stories surrounding Vince, Razzle, and the rest of Motley Crue. Do me a favor, man. He said, I'll throw you the keys, go down and get the Pantera, and go to the liquor store and pick up some stuff for us. We're running out. I've been drinking. I really don't want to drive. Welcome back to the 85 Grave Show. Wow. How are you guys doing? We missed you. I don't think they're going to respond. I know. Well, maybe, you know, in the comments or something. I think they might have forgotten who we are by now. <laughs> good thing we introduced ourselves. Very good thing. <laughs> it's been a minute. It's been a couple minutes, you know. It's been a lot going on, though. So. Yeah, a lot. I'll, I'll touch on that here in a moment. Um, so, yeah, tonight's uh, part two of Razzle. Yeah. So the reason that we're doing part two is because there was a lot of questions in the comments on the, the first episode on part one. And um, we kind of touched on some things in, in the first one, things like, you know, Skylar, you know, Vince's daughter, um, mm-hmm. that we had done some research and never kind of followed through with it. Um, yeah. There was a lot of questions about the two other people in the wreck. Um, I can't remember what else, but there, you know, it was time. And now we got this Vince Neil biography coming out tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's coming out on Reels. Have you heard of what that is? Reels, R-E-E-L-Z. I've never heard of it, but... I haven't either, but it's coming out, it's Motley Cruz Vince Neil, My Story. So it's like a two-hour documentary. Nice, nice. Yeah, it should be pretty juicy. It, it talks about, you know, never before heard stuff, you know. Yeah. So his his side of everything. Right on. Well, we're going to make this quick so we can get to the interview of Jim Thomas, who is oh. the coolest dude. And just so everybody knows, he's not just some random guy. He was a uh, a big time <laughs> anchor man back in the day. I don't know when he retired, but um, he's the man. Yeah. And he was, like we said in the intro, He's he was Vince Neil's neighbor, I think for a couple of years, I think from around 82 to 84. Of course, you, I don't want to give away what happened right after the wreck, but he was Vince Neil's neighbor up, you know, during that time. And he was there the night that it happened. So, um, you know, he'll get into that. This is the first time, this is the first person that we've ever had that was actually at one of the incidents that we've yeah. done an episode about. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we got lucky. He, uh, he was one of the guys that came in the comments and he messaged and then we got in contact and then COVID happened and we, uh, I was going to go out and interview him like, you know, in 2020 or 2021, I think. That's right. Yeah. But we just couldn't get it together because he lives all the way on the East Coast. And mm-hmm. then I had that tour to do out in Florida. So from there, I was like, okay. Like well, now's your chance to yeah, kind of get that. Yeah. I was, so I drove up to Georgia and handled business, you know. Yeah. That um, was so cool of him to like welcome you into his home and you know oh he's so cool and yeah and, you know to trust having a dude looking like me coming into his house <laughs> you know but he, he appreciated the first episode and there was some things that that i got wrong in the uh research and i say i because the research you did there was no problem with it was what i got wrong <laughs> but that was you know it happens because i i wasn't able to uh, and i said on there on the first episode that i wasn't a thousand percent sure about mm-hmm. a couple of things but, you know, and I had to go by clues out of the book and things like that and the police reports, all that. Yeah, just piecing it all together. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of those questions are going to get answered right here in this interview. It's a great interview. And just to touch real quick on why we've been gone so long, for the, for the you know, the obvious reasons with COVID and all that, we couldn't really get out and do our filming, our investigating. It was, you know, it was a weird time. Weird Plus, time to travel, you know. Yeah, weird time to travel, weird time for everything. And then 
you know, I, I've talked I've talked a little bit about it, but I, I make horror films, and 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 you know, Lauren also we we make horror films together. She's acts in them sometimes, and I uh, finished one called Hell Nurse that I was working on for a couple years, and we released it. I actually just started screening it this year, and I've already started on the next one. But that doesn't mean we haven't done anything for the show. Right. We've done a lot of studio upgrades. We got new mics. Um, we got a whole new setups to make production a lot easier. And then when I went out to get this interview with Jim, I also spent, what, about three weeks? Yeah. I, li- I spent three weeks on the road living in a car <laughs> to film, I don't know what, six or seven episodes worth of stuff, different yeah. stuff, movies, oh. true crime, you name it. So and, much stuff yeah, coming and, up. And I think the next one that we're going to put out, I mean, and I've worked on a bunch of them. They're just, it's a tremendous amount of production. But um, I think that the next one that we put out is probably going to be the true crime one. We won't give it away what it is, Mm -hmm. but it's going to be something that we have footage and we have stuff that nobody has ever gotten. And then that I can guarantee you. So we we usually find these things. We're going to um, real quick talk about a couple of things that were in the comments from part one of Razzle, the death of Razzle. So to anybody who doesn't know who Razzle is, he was the drummer of a band called Hanoi Rocks. They came to America in 1984 to um, do their first tour. They were from Finland. The band was from Finland. Finland. He's from England. They got signed. They came out here to America. They were partying. The singer broke his ankle. Then they went out to hang out with Motley Crue. They were partying at Vince Neil's condo for a couple of days. And they ran out of liquor. They got into Vince Neil's car. It was a uh, Pantera, a Ford Pantera. <laughs> I was wondering uh, if you're going to throw that in there. Uh, it was a Ford Pantera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait till these knuckleheads come at me for this. Oh, no. But um, they went to this, you know, there was an accident. Vince Neil crashed the car and uh, Razzle died. They hurt two other people or Vince hurt two other people. Razzle died. Um, that's and that's like the whole seriously story. hurt those two other people. Yes, the other two people I got mean, seriously hurt. We're going to touch on that here in a moment, but beyond that, you really should watch the first episode uh, because we did a lot of cool stuff. We we found the crash site. As F- far as I know, we're the only ones that found it, or we were definitely the first ones that found it. Right, um, we found, found it, it correctly, kind of. Well, found it. It just in general. I mean, people found the wrong locations, but that yeah. means nothing. So, um, it's a cool episode. It's not that long. We got some good footage and some good information, and it was good enough that a guy like Jim contacted me or us because he was impressed with it, and he had a lot more stories. And this is this type of stuff is really what we do this show for, and we want people to comment to us and give us information. If you come off rude, you're just going to get fucked off. So go ahead, be an asshole if you want. You're just going to get fucked off. But when people come nicely and they say, hey, you got this wrong. This is what I know. This is what I've heard. That's what we live. Now, I I live for that. I am thrilled to get new information about any of these episodes. And just because we finished the episode, it doesn't mean that we don't care anymore about Bon Scott or John Bonham or any of these people that we're doing these episodes. We're doing them because this is a very interesting thing. And to us, it's an ongoing thing. Many of these situations, nobody really knows what happened except people who aren't with us anymore. So um, any inside information, we love it. Well, we, we were lucky enough, fortunate enough that Jim contacted me and he has an insane amount of information because he was there. He was very good friends with Vince and um, his interview will speak for itself. Oh, yeah. So, I can't wait till you guys hear this. Well, I guess I can wait because I'm talking too long already. It's really good. Really juicy stuff. Yeah. Like, so um, back to uh, those comments. One of the things is that Everybody was bitching and complaining that there's no such thing as a Ford Pantera. <laughs> it's a, 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 a Damaso Tom. I can now, now I can't even remember what right right uh, what the real thing is. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I called it a Ford Pantera is because that's what Vince Neil called it in the book. Yep. So I figured, okay, well. How could he get it wrong? Yeah, it's his fucking car. (laughs) So Jim explains this, and he explains it very well. People are still going to deny it because you know how people are. They can never admit that they're wrong, especially gearheads, you know? Right, right. But you're wrong. 
you're just wrong. That's all there is to it, you know? You're wrong to say that it's not a Ford Pantera. You're not wrong to say it's that it is a Tom De, Tom Amos, Thomas Damasu Pantera. Fuck, I can't. I'm going to get chewed up just for that. Yeah. We're going to have to make a part three for me to say that right. No, no part three. <laughs> So, um, but that was one of the, that was one of the big ones. And, um, I'm glad that, you know, Jim sets that straight. Um, the other thing was a lot of people wanted to know about Lisa Hogan and, uh, Daniel Smithers. So, you know, I, I did end up, we did do some research. We did find some stuff out, but it's very obvious to us that they don't want to be wrapped up in this stuff. They want to li- move on with their life. I didn't speak to them. I just can tell by where they're living, what they're doing, that they've intentionally stayed out of this and they don't want to be part of these stories, even though they, they are. They don't want to they don't want the publicity. So we're not gonna give away any anything about that. But I will talk about one thing. Um and this is because this was back when it happened. So I guess they were both recovering alcoholics themselves themselves. And um you know, there was an article about it. Let me pull that up. We were able to find, you know, they called it a bitter twist in fate because they had gotten sober and then they got hurt by a drunk driver. You yeah, know? yeah. So, um, it's, you know, it is ironic. And, and here's another question, another thing that people, um, a couple of people looked at the photos that we have and they said, well, in the one photo, you can see Vince Neal's car the Pantera, the Ford Pantera, and it's not smashed on the same side as it is in the other photos. And um, and and I got to admit that was that even me I was like, yeah, they're right. Like, mm-hmm. what's going on here? Yeah. Well, here's what's going on. There was actually a third car involved. There was a car um, driven by. Let me see. I wrote his name down. It's hard to say. His name was Ali Karimi. Kaliabad. So he was driving that other car, that red car. It looks similar to the Pantera, but it but it's not a Pantera. Mm-hmm. But when you see those photos, they're old photos, and you see that other car in the background behind Razzle's Converse sneaker, and it is a little suspicious. It's like, well, why is that car not all smashed up? Well, because that's not the Pantera. It was a third car, and that guy was not hurt in the wreck. He didn't get hurt. Okay. But yeah. um Lisa Hogan, she got hurt really bad. I'll throw a photo up of her from from nineteen eighty four. So that was one of the cars that Vince hit when he it was hit, like, you know, out going out of control. Yeah, he hit two okay. cars. He hit okay. the he hit the Volkswagen and the other red car. I don't know what okay. kind of car it was. Yeah. Another reason that it took a long time to get this one, we were gonna put this one out a few months ago, but then I got contacted by somebody who I don't want to give too much away. I don't know how much the guy wants anybody to know of who he is or what he does Mm -hmm. but he's musically connected to andy mccoy who was the guitarist of hanoi rocks who is also the one who had to come and identify razzle's body after the accident so he he contacted me and me and him talked you know for a few days it was really cool we got on the phone and stuff and he had some great ideas to get to, to get you know he wanted to try to get andy mccoy i didn't necessarily know if it would be a good idea to speak to him because a lot of people look at what we do as like sensationalizing these things and, you know, making money. Everybody thinks we're making like a thousand dollars a day doing this. It's, it's not, it's very, it's, mm. it's only Where? several hundred. It's not thousands. What account <laughs> is that going into? I'd like to see that. Account. I know. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even realize how much we're getting until <laughs> we got that W4 in the mail. Right. Or is that the W2? Uh, some other, yeah. Some other number. And I was like, what the, what the <laughs> fuck is this? I forgot. I set it up to a, I didn't even know. I didn't realize we were making hardly anything off of this. But anyway, yeah, people think that we're exploiting these deaths and stuff. And I guess maybe we are, whatever, you know. Well, that's not our goal, but. Well, it's not the goal, but I'm fascinated with the stuff and I want to share yeah. it with people. And I want people who are also interested in it, which, by the way, if you're watching this shit, you're guilty, too, because you must be interested in it just like we are. We're just finding the information, and putting it out there. If we make money doing it, I promise you. It's not going to cover what I spend doing this. I I <laughs> promise you. No, not at all. Yeah. No. If we could start getting millions of views, it's not going to it's not going to cover what I pay to put these together. So anyway, um I tried to get those together. We we waited and it just it wasn't really happening, you know? 
And I, in the end, I just decided, you know what? Never mind. Let's just let's just get stick with just the gym's interview and not turn it into a big a yeah. big thing that you know I'm going to be chasing people and possibly getting into any kind of you know weird situations with people. So well, uh, Jim's you know, interview is killer. So yeah, Jim's you guys will is, not be disappointed. No, not at all. And um, I know we're we're already talking. We're already at 16 minutes. But um, you know, uh, there's chapters. Just click click to the chapter if you want to skip what we're talking about. So the next thing is Skyler, which is Vince's daughter. Now a lot of idiot piece of shit come on the comments, <laughs> and, and they're like, oh well. Vince's daughter died because he murdered Razzle. Like, you're a fucking idiot to say something like that. Yeah, you like know, karma is coming yeah, to him or something. And I something. get it. I know. I understand trolling and all that, but fuck you. You know, that's, that's, fuck. This is a dude's daughter. Yeah. You know? She was only four. I don't care how, you know, even just regardless. Yeah. That's a shitty fucking thing to say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, enjoy, enjoy your fucking life, you know, behind a computer saying dumb shit like that. But, Regardless, you know, we did touch on the fact that there was uh, that that there was some kind of lawsuit or I, I had I had tried to research it several years ago and I had found I thought it was electrical power lines. But you did some research and you found more about it, about what it was. And what I'm saying is, yeah, that there was supposedly some attribute to her death that had to do with i thought was power lines from what i had remembered but what was it exactly yeah no so it wasn't power lines but um it was rocketdyne and so it's like a test site Mm -hmm. and they and he claimed that they were knowingly dumping hazardous materials uh near their former home so they lived like a few miles away from this test site yeah and it was like plutonium and uranium this was like all in the lawsuit and they think that caused skyler's a uh, rare form of cancer. And she wh- had liver cancer. Liver cancer. And wasn't there like a kind of a cluster of of um, cancer in that area? Or yeah, alleged, no. I guess they have to say allegedly a oh. cluster, I guess. Yeah, I guess means- there were residents. Uh, they were all noticed like an increased rate of cancer like around the plant, you know, in that whole area. But it was, you know, I'm not sure if it was just children or adults too. It was just an increased rate of cancer. So that's kind of weird. Um, yeah. But yeah, and, and it's that's so tragic. Um, but and and then even more tragic is his case was dismissed. So I, I don't even know, you know, he nothing came out of that. Wow. Like I think his lawyer dropped the ball. Um, I read that his lawyer failed to provide documents wow. uh, that were requested by the company to prepare for the case. So maybe, you know, his lawyer wasn't communicating with the other lawyer, whatever the case was, the, can, the can judge you, dismissed it. Can't you get in trouble for that if you're a lawyer? Yeah, he got sanctioned. The judge did sanction really? Vince's lawyer. And uh, and then, you know, they neither one of them showed up to the to the dismissal. So I don't, you know... Mm-hmm. It's sort of just up in the air now of what happened. So I'm going to need to either do more research, but I think it's over. I mean, it was dismissed. Yeah. Well, maybe that's uh, <sighs> maybe that's something for Vince to tell when he if he ever feels like you know that's something he wants to talk about. Right. It might be in that documentary that's being released tomorrow. Yeah, maybe I can't wait for that. We almost waited until that was done, but I'd rather throw out what we have and see if we're wrong about anything you know yeah yeah i'm I'm looking forward to watching that uh for sure me too definitely Um, i think we're gonna make a night of it right yeah (laughs) (laughs) because there's two there's what two episodes of it yeah it's it's like a two out like a part two parts two and they're each an hour long so that'd be cool yeah i did find an article um you know because of course they're uh you know everybody is like oh vince was just partying and he didn't give a shit anymore or whatever Mm -hmm. well a year after the crash um they, uh, you know, he did he did an interview on uh, for a newspaper, and you know, he was talking about how he was so freaked out that he couldn't even leave his house for like nine months after the wreck, and then and then when he was finally sentenced, he was, you know, he he was convinced. Everybody thinks that like he just got arrested, and then they told him, oh well, we're gonna let you off, and like no, that doesn't work that way. They they let you stress on that shit for months, and you you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> they don't they 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 uh they let you. Like sweat it out. They let you sweat it out and they and they wait for you to break and admit something or do something. And, um, you know, he was he didn't just get to fuck around, you know. But anyway, well, he, you know, he, he says that he was 
um, you know, when he got sentenced, he was like, he thought he was going to jail for several years. Even his lawyer mm-hmm. was telling him, you're, you're gone, you know. But what happened was, of course, and I, and I touched on this a little bit, but the, here's the real figures, the real numbers. They decided that, you know, he owed two debts. To, he owed two debts. He owed one to society and he owed a debt to the people who got hurt in the wrecks and Razzle's family. So I don't know what Razzle's family got, but Lisa Hogan, the girl who got her arms broke and her leg broke, and um, she was in a coma or, or on life support for a couple of weeks, I think. She was she got hurt bad brain injuries. So did Smithers, the guy. Yeah. They both got hurt. But obviously she got hurt way worse because she got $1.3 million. And Daniel Smithers got – and Daniel Smithers was the, was the driver of the Volkswagen. He got 700000 hmm. which back in those days, I was a lot more than it is now. You know, that would, that would yeah. probably be the equivalent of a couple of million, and she probably got the equivalent of a few million. That's, you know, yeah. what I would call it. They decided that, you know, so, so that, that's another big thing. Oh, he, he got off easy. He, he, he didn't have to do enough jail time, blah, blah, blah. And um, that's true. He didn't. But the reason he didn't is because the prosecutors, the judge, and the victims, and I have to repeat, and the victims decided that for him to pay his second debt, which was the financial debt, you know, the, what do you call that, restitution? Or, or is restitution something else? Yeah, yeah, that well, sounds right. Whatever it is, they, the money he owed them for their civil suit, mm-hmm. they decided that if he's in prison, and when I say they, again, that's the victims as well, they decided that if he's in prison and Motley Crue disbands, he'll never be able to pay that. And they had they had medical needs and they needed they needed things, you know. And, wow. and um so they decided collectively that it would be better if he was touring and making money so that he could pay them. And I know that Nikki was complaining, like, hey, we're paying your debts. We're out here on tour and we're paying your debts and you're still, you know, you want to drink and you want to get fucked up and you know. And, and I think that part in the dirt when they were saying like when he was like, I want to have a cocktail too, you know. That was probably the time that they were, well, it definitely was the time where they were really touring and the money they were making was going to pay that stuff off. But they all made that decision too. They, because for Motley Crue to continue, they needed, you know, that was the only way. Mm-hmm. And so everybody did what they had to do. Vince got a light sentence. Um, he was in a unique position where he was able to truly help those people by paying them millions of dollars. And, I, I got to admit, if it was me, I would have probably wanted the same thing. I would have been like, you know what? The guy it fucked up, and um, I'm not going to touch on it because I don't know what I would do unless I was in that situation. So Yeah, I'm that's gonna, hard to... Yeah, I, I, anybody can say any bullshit until it happens, or it happens to somebody I know. If that yeah. happens to some, my family... I mean, I that's would, what the judge and everybody agreed upon. That's mm-hmm. what they did. I mean, I don't know. He didn't sound doesn't sound like he has a big choice in that. Yeah, but you know, and we kind of touched on. I, I, you know, I just had the feeling that, you know, just by seeing things that he had said, I've never seen him like deny that he did it or none of that. Mm-hmm. But people make it like he does, like he just, like he doesn't take responsibility for it. And I've seen him take plenty of responsibility for it. But Jim knew him, and Jim knew him very well. And you're going to get a lot more insight on who Vince was. And they're not like friends now. Uh, I think Jim has seen him one time since 1984. So it's not like he's, they're homeboys now and he's sticking up for him or nothing. And he's not sticking up for him. He's just telling, he's telling firsthand information about Vince. He lived, he was, they were next door neighbors in that condo where the, where they were partying down the street from the crash site. And Jim was there that night. He w- he wasn't at the uh he wasn't at the crash but he was at the party he had been to the party it even said in the in the uh book when vince was talking about it we narrate you narrated it he's you know it was like Mm -hmm. it said something like um there was just a few people here razzle and the band and an an nbc anchor man that lived next door (laughs) that's that's him Jim. yeah that's jim he was an nbc anchor man and he was also a cnn anchor man at different times I wonder why he didn't put his actual name in, in the in the book right there. Not that it matters. We know that's who he's talking about. Yeah, um, because uh, he asked, I think they talked about that, and and Vince didn't want to, um, well, you know what, I'll let Jim say it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I forgot that answer is actually in the interview. It is, yeah. 
So, um, good little tidbit, though. Right. So I think uh, without further ado, I think we should uh, let Jim do his thing. Yeah. And uh, thanks for listening to all this time. Thanks for waiting for us. We got a lot of more episodes coming up. Please subscribe. We appreciate that. If you do, we 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 passed the ten thousand subscriber mark while we were on our hiatus. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, we were so stoked. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Now it's over eleven. Oh my god! And we haven't even put anything out. So hopefully, um, hopefully you're not going to regret it because we got some really good episodes to come out. Yeah, we have. We're not going to take this long ever again. <laughs> no, of course not. No way. Absolutely not. So. Thanks for uh, you know sticking by and and waiting for us and and uh, we will see you again very soon. We love you guys. Thank you. Peace. Enjoy the interview. So we're here in Georgia with Jim Thomas, who amongst many other things was Vince Neil's neighbor back in 1984 at the Delphi Condominiums, which is where the infamous party took place the night of Razzle's death. Jim, thanks for allowing us into your home. We really appreciate it. And uh, why don't you give a backstory on who you are and how you knew Vince? Well, my name's Jim Thomas. Um, I, for many, many years, I was a television news anchorman, various uh, cities around the country, but most notably in Los Angeles with KNBC. And uh, I moved into the Delphi Apartments in about 1981, I guess it was. Um, they are right on the waterfront in Redondo Beach. Really pretty, was a pretty building. I, I haven't been there lately. Um, just a great place to live. And uh, uh, I happened to be next door neighbors with Vince Neal and his wife, Beth, and who was pregnant at the time, by the way. Um, but um, the first time I ever laid eyes on him, um, I was... Uh, getting out of my car in the underground garage of the building. And uh, I got in the elevator and the underground garage had two levels. And I was on the bottom level, I got in the elevator and I, I pressed the button to go up to the fourth floor to my condo and it stopped on the second floor of the garage and there was this blonde haired uh, guy and uh, he looked like he'd been in a fight. <laughs> he was dressed all in white. He had like white blonde hair he had mascara on that was running down his face, and he was wearing women's high-heeled shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there I was in my you know anchorman suit with my coat and tie and everything, and I uh, he he looked a little disheveled. <clears throat> and I said, "Hey, uh, how, how are you doing there?" And he goes, "Well, I I got in a fight with my girlfriend." <laughs> and I said, "Okay," I said. Uh, well, in the meantime, the elevator's going up, 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 ding, it, uh, the, it lands on the fourth floor, which is my floor, and I get off the elevator, and he gets off the elevator. And so we're walking down the hallway together, and I walk over to my door, which was, I believe, 405, and he goes over to 404, right next door to it, and opens it up and goes in. And so I thought, wow, I wonder who that guy is. <laughs> And uh, the next day, um, before I went to work, I happened to see him uh, coming in from, I guess he, would, he had been down at the beach or something like that. And as I was leaving my apartment, he was coming in and we introduced ourselves. And he told me he was Vince Neal. Uh, back then, you know, this was before they'd even signed with Warner Brothers or anything. So he was still playing at the Starwood and, and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of, I knew him before he was really, before the fame really, really hit. Um, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're good neighbors. Uh, he was fascinated by my world of being in television news where he could turn on his TV and see me on his TV every night at five or six and 11. And I was fascinated with the whole rock and roll thing because uh, he would take me with him up to Hollywood and we would go to places like the whiskey and stuff like that and hang out. And everybody thought I was his bodyguard because I'm 6'3". And, of course, Vince is probably 5'9 on a good day. <laughs> but uh, all the kids, you know, they didn't watch television news, so they had no idea who I was. Everybody assumed I was his bodyguard. <laughs> but we would hang out a lot. And I hung out a lot with the other guys. Um, 
and uh, got to know them. Uh, Tommy was, you know, has always been crazy and uh, uh, a nice guy though, very, very nice guy. Mick, uh, just like everybody, like you would imagine, was, was very quiet, but also a very nice guy, very into his music. Um, Nikki was, uh, I guess you could say Nikki was uh, not, not edgy is the word, prickly, he was prickly. <laughs> <laughs> you never knew when you were going to say something that Nikki didn't like and he'd, 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 he'd kind of get a case of the ass about it. But again, a, a, a great guy. And even back then, it was obvious who was running the show. It was, it was really Nikki. Nikki was the genius behind everything. Um, the other guys were just kind of like parts of a puzzle, you know, that Nikki was a, a big piece of it. And the other guys just kind of fit together, I guess you could say, and uh, to, to turn into what it what it turned into, which is pretty fabulous stuff. But um, I, I, as their career progressed, I was kind of like standing right there on the sidelines uh, watching it and the Us Festival and uh, when they toured with Ozzy and. Uh, the whole thing just kept going. One day, um, Vince came home and said that he had just been out on a yacht with Doc McGee, and they uh, signed a contract out on the yacht out in uh, Marina Del Rey, and that uh, things were really going to start happening after that point, and they sure did. Um, uh, that was uh, they all suddenly got uh, big paychecks. Um, first thing they all did was go out and buy cars. Tommy, who was very, very thrifty, um, bought a, I think it was a 1980 or 1981 Corvette. It was a pale green metallic color. Um, Mick went to one of these places where they take older cars and put large engines in them and kind of beef them up. And he bought a 76 red Corvette with a four speed and a, and a big engine and it was very, very fast. Um, Nikki bought a brand new black, uh, Corvette. Um, I think it was a 80, it was right when the new Corvettes came out that were the ones that looked like the big erasers, yeah. <laughs> uh, a racer on wheels. I think it was like a 84, 85 maybe. Um, and of course, uh, Vince's first car <clears throat> was a Camaro Z28. But later on down the road, um, as Vince uh, started, the, kept, the bigger checks started coming in, he went up to Hollywood or somewhere up in the valley, I think, and went to a custom car place and, and bought a Pantera, Ford Pantera. It was a car that was originally an Italian sports car, but Ford had somehow worked a deal with the Di Tommaso Company of Italy uh, to distribute this car in the United States, and, and it, it, it was a, it was an exotic car. Let me interject real quick. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so the Z28 is this the one that was in the photo shoot? Yes, in the Cream on the cover of okay. Cream magazine. Great. I was, think it was Cream. Yeah, I, I believe it was. Yeah. Now, um, his his wife at the time is in that photograph. Now that's Beth, correct? That's Beth. Okay, and that's and this is the one he had uh, Skyler with, correct? No, no, no. He had Skyler with, I never met that wife. Uh, she was the one that was the mud wrestler okay. that he met in Hollywood. Her name, I can't remember her name, but he had Skyler with her. Okay. So I wanted to interject because when I did the, when we did the, the part one of the Razzle episode, yes. so many people like just basically tore me a new ass because I called the Pantera a Ford Pantera. It is a Ford Pantera. Exactly. And, yeah. the, and the reason I called it that was because in the Dirt book, that's what Vince Neil called it. Yes. So I knew there was a yes. reason for it. Please elaborate on that and get these people off sure. of my case. No, no. <laughs> well, like I said, it, the, the car was originally designed, the, I think the body was a Pinaferina body. And then, of course, the chassis and the engine and the rear end and everything uh, was uh, made by a company called Di Tommaso. Um, and so originally, when they were sold in Europe, they were Di Tommaso Panteras. Ford somehow worked a deal to bring them to the United States, and it was a rear-engine car, what they call a mid-engine car, where the engine is behind the, the driver. Uh, Ford, when they brought it over here, they still used the Pinaferina body, and they put a Ford engine in. And uh, 
Um, that's why some people call them Ford Panteras later on. Early on, they were Di Tommaso Panteras. Great. So it, whatever, whichever you call them, you're correct. <laughs> okay. So again, I, I only went by what Vince called it. Yeah. I figured he would know better than anybody. So yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Well, in, and in addition to all this, when he bought this car, uh, it was a 72. And this was, you know, the early 80s. So it was a car that had been what car guys call breathed on, meaning that they had uh, enhanced it, uh, made it faster. It had a, this engine was just uh, incredibly loud. It had tailpipes on it like that, two big tailpipes on the back. And as I mentioned, our building had an underground garage. So whenever Vince would start this thing up in the garage, you could, the whole building, you could hear it through the, <laughs> through the entire building. Um, but it, it was uh, the first day he got it, he, he knocked on the door and said, hey, Jim, I just bought this car. Let's go for a ride. So we went down to the garage and he was driving it. We drove it around. Um, we went a couple blocks and he said, you want to try it? And I said, yeah. And so he got out of the driver's seat. I walked around and I tried to fit in it. And it apparently had been designed for a smaller uh, person. Um, I could not operate the, the uh uh, clutch pedal and the brake without my knees hitting the back of the steering wheel. So I, I you know, I, I, I took it a couple blocks and it was very uncomfortable. And uh, so <laughs> I didn't get to really enjoy it, but I could tell uh, it had 500 horsepower. And this was back in the days, nowadays when you have a 500 horsepower car, they have a little button in there. It's a traction control thing. And you, you, if you leave that button off, the car automatically will correct itself if it starts spinning out of control, unless you you hit the button and put it in a mode where it turns that traction control off. But back in those days, there was no safety thing like that. And this thing was just brutal fast. That's one of the, uh, you know, I had to kind of theorize how he could have gotten going that speed and what happened. Yes. Now, what he said was that he shifted into second, and then he hit a water puddle and spun. Now, what I did was when I went out there to the Esplanade, 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 Esplanade. Yeah. Yeah. when I went out there, I measured it from the stop sign to the staircase. It's yeah. about 400, 404 feet. Yeah. So you've driven in the, you've ridden in the car and driven it or tried to drive it. I've driven similar cars. And I can tell you um, that if you have the traction control off mm -hmm. and you make a left-hand turn in first gear, you start off in first gear and then take a left-hand turn and then floor it and hit second, mm -hmm. the car is, the rear end is just going to switch ends on you. And that's exactly With a car that powerful. Now, some of the people were like, there's no way he could get anywhere near 65 in first gear. Is that, you think that's true or? Oh yeah, in that kind of car, yeah. That car, you could, seven, second gear would take you almost to 100 miles an hour. Wow, okay. So, so no, this thing was, it was a race car. Yeah. Street, race car on the street. And that road is no wider than this room, barely. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And and just a little bit of uh, uh, of uh, water in that rear end of brake. I, I did the same thing one time in a Porsche Turbo. Mm -hmm. um, I turned left and kicked it into second and floored it, and the car just spun right in the middle of the intersection. Wow. Um, it's, it, it's it, Anybody who's familiar with driving these kind of cars knows about this. Yeah. Okay, that's going to answer a lot of questions from a lot. Of, a lot of people have a lot of questions about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Which, um, which, by the way, uh, just so everybody knows, um, Jim saw the episode and contacted me to, to give me some information. And yeah. Well, there's. I've been seeing these the, the story being related, you know, in various places. You've done a wonderful job with it. Thank you. But I've seen this story being told, and it seems like every time it's being told. It's being embellished or yeah. mistakes are made in the mm -hmm. way it happened. And I, 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 as I said, I was a good friend of Vince and the guys. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Vince has taken a lot of heat over the, uh, about yeah. this over the years. And, and I wanted to clarify, this is what happened. I'll I was there that night, so I'll yes. tell you what happened. Great. Yeah. Great. So just to skip to that, you know, we can talk about my my adventures with the guys, you know, doing other things, but I'm sure you want to talk about this. I want them both. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I love hearing Molly. You can't, no, you can't get enough Motley Crue stories. Yeah, that's true. If that, you don't that, like it, I'll put timestamps so they can get just to the points. You know? I mean, if, if somebody had told all of us back then that they, they were going to achieve this level of, of fame and fortune, uh, we would all just laugh. <laughs> 
clicked our beers together and said, okay. Uh, but uh, I'll go to that one night right now and we can discuss other things. Okay. December 8th, was it December 8th? It was December 8th. Was, what day of the week was it? Do you remember? I forgot already. I, uh, it seems like it might have been a Friday night or a Saturday night um, because I was not at work. I was not in Burbank at NBC. Okay. Um, there was a French restaurant on the Palos Verdes Peninsula mm-hmm. in um, Malaga Bay. And it was a lovely, lovely French restaurant. Um, Vince and Beth and my uh, girlfriend at the time, we used to go there quite often. But the owner would send his limo down from the peninsula to pick us up. Yeah. Um, and that particular night, it was just me and my fiance at the time uh, going to dinner. And so we were getting ready in the, in the apartment. And we could hear that there was, there, was, there was some kind of party going on at Vince's next door. So I opened the sliding glass doors that are facing the, the ocean and I, I could go over to the side of my um, balcony and I could lean around and, and see the, you know, what was going on yeah. in the next balcony, which is Vince's. So um, I look over there and I see a bunch of guys over there and I said, what's going on, Vince? He goes, oh, we're having a party over here. Come on over. And I said, I can't. We're waiting for the limo to go to the French restaurant up in Malaga Cove. He goes, well, he says, when, when's it going to get here? I said, I, I don't know. He said, can you do me a favor before it comes? I'll throw you the keys to the Pantera if you'll go to the liquor store and pick us up some things because we're running out over here. And I said, well, I don't know if I've got time. He said, look, man, I've been drinking. I don't want to drive that car, you know, after drinking all afternoon. And I said, well, and about that time, the limo pulled up in front of the Delphi there. I said, I got I to I gotta go, Vince. He said, and there, there was a guy sitting there with black hair uh, right near where I was leaning around the balcony. And he said, I'll go with you, Vince. I'll go with you. And uh, he jumps up, and, and Vince said, this is Nicholas Dingley. He's with a band called Hanoi Rocks. And I said, hey, man, how you doing? I reached around and shook his hand. And... Uh, we left the building and got in the limo and went up to Malaga Cove. Um, we came back after dinner and I knocked on Vince's door and nobody answered. I went out on the balcony, looked around and nobody was there. And so the night ended, you know, we went to sleep. The next morning, uh, I received the LA Times. Uh, it would be thrown on my, um, uh, on the landing out in front of my uh, apartment door and I went out and uh, picked up the paper, and on the front page was uh, rock star in automobile crash or something, some kind of headline like that. And you know, it was it was it was very very shocking. Um, and uh, I actually didn't see Vince for quite some time after that, maybe a couple of years. His management team and all the people around him and lawyers and everything immediately got him out of the apartment and they. They, I don't know where he went, where he was living, uh, completely lost contact with him. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then where I could pick up a cell phone and call him. But I actually didn't see him for uh, years later. Um, they did not want him around me because I was in the television news business. Um, they were worried that maybe I would put something on the news or say something or do something that might uh, adversely impact you know, what was going on with him. I, I, of course, I understood. But um, uh, the bottom line of the story is uh, this is one of those situations in life where you're somewhere that you wish you hadn't been. Um, I, I feel like if I had just, I didn't even have to take his Pantera. I could have gone down and got my car out of the garage, gone and bought them, you know, some stuff and brought it back and, uh, you know, would have saved... Uh, my buddy Vince, uh, a lot of uh, pain, and uh, that's basically what happened that night. That says a lot that he, you know, that he asked for a, a you don't call that a designated driver, do you? That's, no, he, he knew. He, yeah. I mean, they had been, they had been down to the beach, and you know, yeah. and it wasn't, uh, you know, the movie The Dirt, <laughs> where yeah. they show this elaborate place. Yeah. It was a one-bedroom apartment. Yeah, they, yeah. I had a one bedroom, he had a one-bedroom next door to it. Mm-hmm. There were maybe like, 10 guys in there during the day, you know, yeah. guys were coming and going, drinking. And, 
Yeah. And they'd go down to the water. And, uh, I mean, we were literally, you could throw something and hit the, hit the water from yeah. the, you know, from the balcony. <laughs> but, uh, no, they had just, they'd been having a good time. They were celebrating. I, I, I don't know the details of why the Hanoi Rocks guys uh, were there that day. I'm sure you probably may know that. I know. Um, they were, they, ca they had came to America for a tour. And um, I think it was the singer, Michael Monroe. I think he broke his ankle. Oh, okay. So he had to take a few days off. And during those that day, those days off, they flew out to L.A. to hang oh, out with Motley Crue guys okay. because you know they, they had to take a few days off their tour. Yeah, and uh, that was Razzle's dream was to get to Los Angeles and party and hang out with people. You know, uh, the whole thing's just uh, it's just so tragic. I you know even to this day, all these years later. Yeah, um, I you know what I, if what ifs. I think the worst part of it is like I don't know Vince. Yeah, but I can you know. I've seen the way he's reacted to everything that's happened. Yeah. And I think that people give him a bad rap on, you know, like, oh, he's just this heartless guy that didn't care and he bought his way out and all that. But in my, and I said it in the video and a lot of people gave me a lot of flack, but they're, you know, but I, to me, you know, it kind of could have happened to any of those guys. Any of It, it could have happened to me. You know, it could have, yeah. And, um, um, you, know, you knew him well. Like, it, 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 it was a combination of uh, 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 bad timing. Very powerful car, mm -hmm. um, and and fate, yeah. And why it had to hit him, particularly at that time when they were just really, you know, they were picking up speed, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I knew Vince, like I said, for a couple of years, uh, and and I'm not overstating this. We were good friends. Yeah. I, I went just about everywhere with him. I I went uh, to Tommy's 21st birthday party at his parents' house out in Cobina. You know, I, I hung out with them a lot, and they were all nice, decent, hardworking yeah. kids, and including Vince. Vince is just a very nice guy, yeah, with big heart. And uh, uh, you know, I think people have a tendency to um, uh, have a tendency to think about people who are wealthy or famous mm -hmm. as being cynical or cruel or mean. Or just entitled, like and, he didn't yeah, care. Entitled, he did. Yeah, entitled, he did. That was not the kind of person. I'm sure that he suffered terribly. Oh, I'm sure. What happened. He, and he wasn't even rich at that time, right? I mean, he had some he, money. He was on his, you know, he was on his way. He he, he, he was starting to get those those checks yeah. from Warner Brothers. Yeah. And like I said, that's how he paid for that car. That car at that time was probably, you know, this was 1983, I guess. I think that would have been Electra. That they had signed to at that point was Electro. Records. It was Electro. Yeah, I think Warner. I think they might have went to Warner Brothers later. Uh, wasn't it called Warner Electro? It might have been. Yeah, because I know Zootot worked for Warner Electro. Yeah. So okay, then yeah, Zootot was there all the time. And Electro was probably a subsidiary then, right? Or a subsidiary. Yeah. Where, uh, well, I, I, here this is an interesting thing. I <laughs> I got out uh, to to show you. This is a um, cassette. Oh, wow. uh, when this came out. Uh, uh, on Warner, he, he, uh, Vince had a box of these and he gave me one of these. It's got a special seal on it. I don't know if you can see yeah, it. Yeah, it does have a Warner logo on it. Yeah, it has this thing on here. It's not for sale, you know, to the public. It was, it yeah. was, it was a promo thing that they gave all the guys a box of them. And he, he gave me one. And I still have it. That's amazing. Yeah. See, this is why we need to get it from people who actually was there at the time and what was going on because I know everything in print about what happened, Yeah, but I wasn't there. Well, you know, when you live in Los Angeles, it's amazing the people you run into and the people you know, but uh, the fact that my next door neighbor <laughs> was Vince Neal, to this day, I still, you know, it's like, wow, that was a, that was a crazy time. So you, you met, you met, briefly met Razzle. I, you know, he, like I said, he jumped up out of the chair and said, Vince, I'll go with you. Yeah. And uh, oh, it still gives me chills, and I yeah. wish, wish that hadn't happened. And you haven't, you haven't seen Vince at all since any of this? Um, I know you, you saw him again a couple of years later. Right? Yeah, he, uh, you know, back when he was at the height of his fame, his phone number would change every week, you know, because yeah. people would get it. Um, I, he was, uh, I had moved uh, to Atlanta from Los Angeles, and he was uh, performing in Atlanta, and I called... Uh, I can't remember which, the Rich Carlton, I think it was. Okay. 
and said, uh, uh, I'm a good friend of Vince Neal. Is Motley Crue staying here? And I gave them my name. And they said, well, we can't give you that information. But if he is here, I'll tell him and he'll call you back. And sure enough, uh, he called me back. He was, he was staying at the Ritz-Carlton. And uh, we spoke a little bit on there. He was, he was on his next wife from the one that I, from Beth Neal, yeah. the next one. And so we, he actually gave me a phone number that we were able to talk for a, a couple months before he changed it again. <laughs> and I lost track of him again. Um, I then, um, he, I knew who his management company was. Mm -hmm. And I took a job anchoring the news in Sacramento, California. And he was coming to play in Sacramento, Motley Crue was. And so I called the management company and I said, uh, I'm Jim Thomas, an old friend of Ben Steele. Can you get me tickets? Blah, blah, blah. And they said, sure. And they got me backstage passes and stuff like that. And so I saw him in Sacramento. And this was at the, this was the, which tour was it? It was the uh, uh, Dr. Feelgood tour. The big one. They were, oh my gosh, they were at their peak. That yeah. show was so fantastic. Um, uh, I hired a limo. And they allowed me and my wife at the time to take the limo down inside the Coliseum uh, a parking lot and drive right up to where their dressing rooms were. Nice. And uh, so we got to hang out with them backstage and, and they all just looked great. You know, they were all in, uh, they'd been working out and, you know, their, their stage costuming had gone, got really dramatic. I'll never forget, he said that they, uh, they were playing the Northern California area and what they did was they were staying in a hotel in San Francisco with a helipad. Wow. And each of them had their own private helicopter nice. because the, the management didn't want them, if there was an accident, mm -hmm. they didn't want all four of them on one helicopter in an accident. So they would fly in separate helicopters. Yeah. And they would fly from, Sacram I mean, from San Francisco, on this occasion, to Sacramento. They'd land out in the parking lot. Yeah. play the gig, jump in the helicopter, go back. That's and then awesome. the next night, you know, they, they're still staying in the hotel and they, they go to Seattle or something up by helicopter. And that was, that was how they managed the oh, whole they were Wow. Yeah. It was well, kind of cool. They were probably saving a lot of money because that is when they were sober. They were That's sober right. for that yes, tour. Yes, they were. So they were probably saving tens of thousands of dollars a week yeah. on, uh, just from that alone. I saw them on another tour the, oh, the Theater of Pain tour. I saw them in Long Beach, and they were not in good shape. That um, was just that. That was uh, the, the the next album after the accident. Yeah. Um. So uh, yeah, I would imagine that's. That, yeah, that they they, they were out of tune. Uh, the music was off rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like the only guy that was really playing the music properly was was Mick. Oh yeah, and uh, it was t they actually got booed. <laughs> the audience was booing them; they were so bad. Wow. And so I guess you know something happened, and they straightened them out because by the Doctor Feel Good tour, man, they were they were cracking. That was probably Nikki, probably cracking the whip, yeah. getting them all back in shape. You know? While well, we're on the subject of Nikki, yeah, Nikki is a great storyteller. Yeah, and uh, Nikki, uh, 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 you got to take what Nikki says with a grain of salt. <laughs> Because he he created the legend of mm -hmm. Motley Crue, uh, but a lot of the stuff is really phony baloney stuff. Is it just like embellished or just? <laughs> I, 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 I it, it's based on maybe a thin thin <laughs> yeah. uh, truth. I'd say John Karabi speaks about this off. I don't know if you've seen a lot of the Karabi interviews. I've never seen him speak about Nikki Six. Yeah, I'll have well, to look that up. there's one just recently that he talked. You know, he always talks nice about him. He never he never says anything really bad about him. But yeah. I just saw an interview with him recently where he said, you know, Nikki was the keeper of the legend, and he he tended to you know be a little extravagant in some of his uh, stories. And uh, when I, when I heard him say that, I thought, yeah, I know, man, I know. But you know, it's 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 a great story. It's they they are entertainers. Yeah, and and that's really what it comes down and to. And he created the legend, and it's cool, and people love it. And you know, uh, but it, you know, uh, they're only human. They're not superhuman guys. <laughs> so um, so just just I know you wouldn't know the answer to this, but since you you brought that up, just a personal opinion. Do you believe he kept diaries during those years, or do you think? Um, well, Karabi. 
uh, not Karabi, uh, the guy that was in London with him, uh, Lizzie. Lizzie, I don't remember what Lizzie, his real name was Steve Perry, and he couldn't use it, obviously, because a rat Steve Perry. Oh, yeah. And so he called himself Lizzie. Oh, uh, rat Stephen Piercy. Piercy. Yeah. Piercy. Yeah. No, Steve Perry, the, the, uh, 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 there's another Stephen Perry uh, rock star. Journey. Journey. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, I just saw an interview somewhere else recently uh, from a guy that was with him in London. The band uh, in in um, Nikki's band before Motley Crue. The, oh, the band London. London. Okay. And he said that Nikki, you know, embellished and and uh, and of course we're talking about the Heroin Diaries. Yes. Yeah. Now th this guy, um, uh, he also said that before the Heroin, uh, before this latest book came out. The first twenty-one, I think it's called, uh -huh. uh, by Nikki. Yeah. Okay. Um, that Nikki called him and tried to get because Nikki had forgotten so much stuff because you know the lifestyle they were living. Yeah. You know they they say if you were if you were there you're not going to remember it. <laughs> yeah. And and he called this guy and, and said you know did I do this did I do that do you remember me doing this and so. You know, mm -hmm. Nikki's kind of having to piece together a lot of his early stuff by talking to old friends. Yeah. And seeing what they remember. Well, that says a lot about his, uh, his him wanting to be integral. In, into, is that the word? In, integral? Integral? Yes. Have integrity. Yes. About his stories. Yes. At least he wants to. He's a, he's a genius. Nikki's a genius. There's just no doubt about it. Um, wow. What a, what a wonderful catalog of music uh, yeah. he's given us all. And, and performances and... And the legend, um, you know, he, he deserves everything that, that he's, uh, he's achieved. Oh, I got to admit those books are, I mean, that's yeah. one of the reasons I, I've got them right here behind me. Oh yeah. Here's I the, see the dirt. I see the the there it is. You know, I read that myself, <laughs> um, when I was on tour, cause a lot of that's in Japan. Yeah. So I would read it as I was in the cities that he wrote from. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah. They, uh, um, I, I, I think I may have told you this, but I, I appear in, in both of Vince's books. He mentions me. That's right. Yeah. I'll find that. In, uh, but, and, and, uh, but he doesn't say your name. He right? doesn't say my name because he was afraid that it would taint, it somehow taint my, you know, career as a yeah. newsman. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Vince. That's the, Well, now i got to find that's... those parts, you know, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to find those parts and read them to people. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll point them out to you. Okay, great. It, it was both in, uh, what was it, tequila and something and, and the dirt. Wow. Both of those books. Yeah. I haven't I haven't read the tequila one. Yeah. Yeah, I need to. I can't remember the rest of the time. Yeah, <laughs> something I, to do I, with tequila. Yeah, I know I know the book. I, I can't think of that either. <laughs> no, I just I have fond memories of the guy. He he was uh we were both young men together in uh in a, a wonderful uh world of Los Angeles at the time. Los Angeles was a great place to be and if you were successful in uh in, at that time, there were just wonders to be found. I, I, I remember um, going down to the Troubadour one night, and uh, we met uh, David Lee Roth there, and uh, the three of us. Uh, <laughs> the, I don't know. Those of you who know the Troubadour know that the bathrooms there are uh, awful. Yeah. <laughs> They're like one one stall bathrooms, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, David had a, a big container full of things that Powers. people like to put up. Yeah. They, you know, you, it, I didn't like it that much. I just liked the smell of it, people used to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we would go in that little awful little bathroom in there and do lines with David Lee Roth. Which wow. Is, what a memory that is, huh? I played at that place one time, but you yeah. were in and out, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that. I know, <laughs> I know just about those restrooms. People think they're yeah, so, such think. glamorous places <laughs> until yeah. they see them. <laughs> I'm surprised. Yeah, I, I think people will be shocked. Yeah. You know? If you only have read, even just being on tour and, and right. what you think tours are like, and right. being on them, it's too complete. I'll, I'll tell you another quick Nikki story. I was right. talking about how prickly he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had bought a, 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 bought a brand new black Corvette, and they went, I think they went on the tour where they were with Ozzy. Okay. And uh, I think what happened was uh, he was living up in Hollywood. Uh, but he drove the Corvette down and parked it in Vince's garage while they went on, on tour. And I think the two of them took a limo to the airport okay. is why he left the Corvette in Vince's garage in the Delphi. Well, 
it was sitting down there, sitting down there, and they'd been gone for like a month. And um, I saw I saw it parked down there, and I asked Beth. I said, uh, "Is that is that Nikki's?" And and she said, "Yeah, I got the key to it." I said, "I you know that this is a new Corvette just came out. I'd love to take it around the block." And she <laughs> said, "Here you go." And she threw me the keys. So I took it out. And I took it around the block. And I was careful with it. I, I didn't abuse it or anything. But uh, just for the heck of it, it, it had it was almost out of gas, and so I took it to a gas station and filled it up with gas. Mm-hmm. Well, when Nikki came back from the tour, he got in the car and he re- had realized that he had almost run it out of gas, bringing it down to Redondo Beach to Vince's house, and wanted to know why the gas tank was full. <laughs> and Beth told him that Jim had taken it around the block and f- decided to fill it up for him. And and he didn't speak to me for, for quite some time. Wow. He was mad at me. Wow. Even though I filled it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he didn't want anybody driving his car, but I guess that's understandable. Most guys are like that. Yeah. But that's yeah. Nikki. Wow. <laughs> Did, um, um, was Vince living near you? Or were you guys neighbors when they played the Oz Festival? Yes. Yeah? We were in the Delphi. Wow. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact... The week before he did the US Festival, he we were I was over there. We used to sit around in, in his living room and watch MTV. I mean that's what we did all day long, is watching <laughs> to see whose whose videos were coming on, you know, yeah. waiting for them to their videos to come up. And uh, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, oh man, he says, uh, I got my costume for uh, the US Festival. And he went in this uh, bedroom and he put it on, and that was that famous. You know, thing with the, the shadow of the devil. Yeah, with the le- leather thing on the on the shoulder, and it's mm-hmm. like leather straps, red and black. Yeah. And I said, "Wow!" I said, "You know, there's not much costume there." And he <laughs> goes, "Yeah, I know." I said, uh, "I said, well, you know, where would you take something like that to get cleaned?" He said, "Cleaned? <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't get this cleaned." And uh, it was so funny, but it had a little thing on it. It was like a horn that sat on one shoulder. And uh, uh, there was a movie, a uh, horror movie uh, that uh, was out back then. And Vince and Nikki used to like to sit in their apartment when they lived up in Hollywood and watch horror movies on the TV. Yeah. And, and there was this movie about a guy who had a brother who was deformed and was like a, a twin that sat on his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> had a little face, uh-huh. so you had the guy's face, and then the little. And his, his name was Lyle. It was, and, and there were characters in this horror movie. Uh-huh. And so, when Nikki saw the costume with this thing, he called it Lyle. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's yeah. what he named his little his little leather so, piece. To this day, whenever I see Vince on that uh, with that costume on, I, there's Lyle sitting on the shoulder. <laughs> And that became, and that was their, that became, I don't know if they, um, I, I don't know if Shout Out the Devil was, I think it wasn't out yet, right? Shout Out the Devil was not out yet, but that costume that he, that they wore, all the costumes they wore at that festival was ones they yeah. wore on the album. Yes, and that's videos. correct. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, that so, was a famous costume. It was a woman uh, that made those costumes. She also made Kiss's costumes, I believe. Okay. Um, she had an unusual name. She it was like a Norwegian name. Okay. And um, I can't remember her name, but uh, that was his first. All the guys had costumes made uh, from her, but that was the one I remember the most from from Vince. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, did you ever uh, go to Tommy Lee's house? Yes. Well, uh, he lived with his parents. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. He lived out in Covina. Um, he was still a teenager, huh? For, he was, was 19, yeah. yeah. His, uh, and his sister, Athena, uh, also lived with their, with their parents. Their parents, I think Athena might have been maybe, she might have been a couple years older than him. I can't remember. Hmm. But she actually formed a band, I understand, herself. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know what, what what level of success they achieved, but uh, yeah, she was in the music. Her pa- his parents were wonderful. Yeah, um, his mom was actually born in Greece, okay. and she was uh, a beauty contestant. She was Miss Greece when she was young. Wow. Yeah, I remember. I, I remember uh, reading in the book something about that. Him saying something about yeah. That. Oh, there was also a, a, a situation. Uh, I told you how thrifty Tommy was. Yeah. Tommy didn't like to spend money. Um, Tommy was either in the rainbow or somewhere where there was a stairwell uh-huh. 
And he was coming down the stairwell and there were no lights on the stairwell and he missed a step and he fell down and he broke a tooth. And I think he twisted a, his arm or something like that. And an attorney got wind of it and a personal injury attorney and he wound up getting a $40,000 settlement. He sued the rainbow? Yeah, this attorney convinced him to sue the rainbow. Wow. It, it was I, I'm not sure if it was rainbow of his yeah. It was somewhere I wasn't there when it happened. But he, they settled out of court for forty thousand. Could have been the whiskey. The whiskey's got this horrendous staircase. You got to go down. Might have been the, the whiskey. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but anyway, there. That was before they were all making the money from the recording contract. Yeah. But he he was he was loaded. He had forty grand in the bank, and he wouldn't spend any of it. Yeah. They kept saying, "Come on, you know, take us to Hawaii or something." He's, like, "I'm not, I'm not spending that money." He yeah. was always very thrifty. Oh, he's, he seems to be the one that holds on to his money yeah. quite well. You yes, know, he like holds on to his uh, seems to his houses and all that. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, any other any other cool uh, Motley Crue stories? I've got one where one day we were, uh, you know, uh, Mick lived in Redondo Beach too. Okay. Uh, he lived on Catalina, uh, which was one uh, uh, road back from the Esplanade. And one day we were over at Mick's house sitting around watching MTV probably and knock on the door and it's uh, like UPS. I don't know if it's FedEx or UPS. And they had a big crate, big wooden crate about this big um, that they delivered. We brought it into the living room and we got some screwdrivers or something and opened it up and it was from BC Rich. Okay. And it was Warlock guitars. There's like four of them in this wow. crate. And he pulled them out and he was looking at them and I went, wow, that's really, that's really cool. He says, you want one? Oh, and he gave me a black warlock. Nice. And uh, I had it for a long time. I, I used to keep it on a stand and um, I bought a house in Harbor City a few years later. And I, we had a 4th of July party. We must have had 50 people over at our house for 4th of July. And it was sitting in the living room. Uh, when the day began uh, in, in the little cradle thing, and uh, when everybody left that night, it was gone. Oh man! So uh, uh, that somebody awesome. clipped it. <laughs> Whoever's out there, uh, let us know. Show us the guitar. Yeah, I don't know that they knew that it was from Mick Mars. They might have just thought it was mine, you know, that I had bought it. But it was a Mick hand gave it to me one day i promise i won't come and kick your door in so i can bring this guitar back to jim <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah wow that was, that was a cool, kind of interesting story that's amazing so um uh, so when, when you reconnected with vince that couple of years did you ever actually see him again or did you just talk to him um well let's see uh, i just saw him backstage at sacramento mm -hmm. oh, uh, right. after you, that you um, down there. actually i moved to columbus georgia where I live now, mm -hmm. and he came through after right after uh, he quit the band. Yeah, he was touring small venues around the country uh, with his own band, and he actually came here to Columbus and was playing a small concert venue here in Columbus. And again, uh, because uh, uh, I, it's a small town, I know a lot of people. I was able to find out which hotel they were in, yeah. and found out that uh, he, where he was staying. And he got a message to me to come to the concert. There'd be tickets for me. And my wife and I, Melissa, uh, my current wife, uh, we went down there, saw the concert, and he was on his bus. He, he immediately left the stage, went on his bus, and took a shower. And uh, we waited outside the bus for him to, to get uh, cleaned up after the show. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the bus doors opened, and there he was standing there. We went on to his tour bus, and... and uh, Talked to him for a while. Awesome. Uh, that was the last time I actually spent uh, time with him. Did he ever talk to you at all about the accident? No. Um, that night when we went on the bus and talked to him, he was talking about how he was suing Motley Crue for throwing him out of the uh, band. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. And, and he threw out a number. He said that if I win this lawsuit, it's worth $40 million. I said, oh, my God, Vince. <laughs> and, uh, but he was... Uh, he was like, yeah, no big deal, you know. I'm yeah. not the crew anymore, you know. I'm having a good time. Yeah. Uh, and that was the last time I saw him face to face. Okay. 
His his solo band did fairly well. I mean, for the especially for the time. I mean, his video was on MTV. They were good. You know? Yeah, he he was still in great shape, and yeah. and uh, and the band was excellent. Uh, Steve, what was what's the guitar player? Uh, Steve Stevens. Steve Stevens yeah. was playing with him from Billy Idol, right? Yes, yeah. yes. They were they were very very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, One day I'll probably run into him again somewhere somewhere. That uh, occasionally I run into people who for whatever reason, uh, have been talking to him or know him or something. And I said, tell Vince, I said, hi. <laughs> well, if I ever run across, I've, I've been in the vicinity with him. Yeah. But I don't like to go bother people. Yeah. You know, I'm certainly not going to ask him about this stuff. No. Because you know, no. that's not nice. You know, no. he doesn't know me like that. And it's not just this, you know, the, the loss of his daughter, that, Skylar. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's paid a big price for his fame. Big, big, big price. Yeah, that's to me. That's like the the most despicable part is like the people who say, "Oh well, that's his payback for." No, that's no, no, that's, no. that's that's like that's the worst thing you could possibly say. That's just know? not fair. That's awful. You know, that no, nothing like. What do you know about that? Like, okay, so here's here's what I have found with with uh, the Skyler incident. Yeah. Um, was that the neighborhood he lived in? There was some kind of problems with the power lines or something? Do you know anything about there that? There was talk of that, but yeah. I, I don't know anything concrete about it. I yeah. really, honestly don't. Uh, it might have just been some sort of a random, you know, genetic thing or something like that. And how, and how long after you saw him did that happen? Because it happened while he was out of Motley Crue, I think. Uh, it happened... I know in the, in the movie... He was living in Malibu. Uh, when it happened, and I can't remember really what years that was. He had a he had a place right there on the beach, um, but I, I can't I can't I can't you know some of these things run together in your brain. Yeah, I'm not sure. In the dirt movie, he was out, but we can't go by that. That movie's that's yeah. a movie. It's you know they're yeah, not trying they, to be factual they, about everything. No, no, no. That movie. <laughs> I, I just have to laugh when they show yeah. the party scene. You know, like before he and Razzle get in the car. And they even used a Corvette in the movie instead yeah. of a pan. Of course, yeah. they probably didn't want to smash a Pantera. But. <laughs> That's true. Probably not easy to get. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the elaborate uh, display of, of that party, you know, was that was pretty funny. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. Just some kids in a <laughs> crappy apartment, right? <laughs> one bedrooms apartments, yeah. Of course, those one bedroom, because they were on the water, they were very yeah. expensive. So I got I got the, you know, you're the one that, that um, that made me realize I got the, the condo wrong. And yeah. the reason I got it wrong yeah. is because I went by Tommy Lee's description. I knew it was either that one or one a little further towards the accident site and on the other side of the street. No, it's the, across the street. Yeah, and the reason I thought that is because Tommy Lee said that when you went out the front door, you had to curve to the, you had to look to the left to see the accident. So he just yeah. doesn't know his left from his right. I think, to, yeah, Tommy, you know. Or he was maybe totally wasted and just doesn't remember. Could I mean, be, could be. Um, I know that uh, the the way the garages were uh -huh. on the first two floors, the subterranean garages, mm -hmm. the garage level that Vince parked on, you could only go in and out of it by going right out onto the Esplanade. Okay. Now the second floor garage, you could only go in and out on the alley okay. behind the the Delphi building. Yeah. And that was the way I went in and out, but Vince. You know, when you'd hear the the rumbling in the building, <laughs> you knew you could look out over the balcony and see the Pantera coming out of the front of the building. And the way it would have happened, of course, I wasn't there. I was at Malaga Cove. He he and, and Razzle would have gotten in the car, driven out the front of the building, turned right, gone down to the Esplanade, made another right turn, and then down that street on the left side was the liquor store. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So... Where the accident happened was retracing, coming back, mm -hmm. coming down the street where the liquor store is and turning left back onto the Esplanade. Mm -hmm. That was where the whole thing, the accident occurred. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, I had found um, some, some, you know, the only places, you know, where anybody has tried to locate it. Yeah. They had it at, you know, that first place where you said you got to turn left. They yeah. had it at that intersection. And yeah. It couldn't be there because there was a stop sign there. And then he would have had to run a stop sign, which... Well, it wasn't only 85 Grave that had video that that mm -hmm. was incorrect, so don't yeah. feel bad because I've seen another 
uh, so-called documentary somebody did with their cell phone. Yeah. And they showed it the route and it's the wrong. Well, I, show, I, I think I saw that one too. They got the crash site wrong. Yeah. yeah. They got everything wrong. Yeah, that was really wrong. Yeah. Uh, all I got wrong was the apartment, was, was the condos. Yeah. And I based it off of two things. Like I say, Tommy Lee saying how it looked when you came out and had to run down the street. Yeah. And also Vince saying that he could look out, he looked out the back window or the window and saw um, Mick Mars down on the beach, yes. sleeping. So I thought, okay, it has to be on the beach. But you're right, where no, those we, are. We, we we saw. I was with him that day. Yeah, when Mick was down there, <laughs> he was laying in the sand with the waves lapping over him, and it's fully dressed in black. Yeah, and we ran down there and grabbed him. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't know if he was trying to wade out into there. Or what what is what he was doing? But he was he was having a bad day. Let's yeah. just say Mick was having a bad day. And that was the same day of the accident, I believe. I no, it was not. Was it day before, like earlier than that? Yeah, it might have been close. It might have been a few days, maybe a weekend before that. Okay. It was not the same day. No. Yeah. No. I know uh, I think Mick had a lot of women problems. Yeah. He did. Yeah. He had and he had some beautiful girlfriends. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. I'm sure. Mick had excellent taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's everything. Oh, what yeah. well, uh what is, what is, what, oh Interesting thing about the Delphi, uh -huh. um, the uh, famous woman wrestler, China, C H yeah. Y N A, she passed away in the in the Delphi in one of the one bedroom apartments. That's right. I remember you telling me that, and I never I never realized that. Do you, you know which one, which apartment? I don't know which one, yeah. um, but um, uh, I just read this myself recently. I was shocked. Yeah. Um, but it's like it's like the building has a curse on it. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, I'll have to. I'll, I'll research that, and then I still got to send you some, you know, you know, like my footage of the correct building. Yeah. I want you to show me the two balconies. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I've got a photograph. I'll show you. I've got it on my phone now. Perfect. You. Perfect. Appreciate that. <laughs> right now, uh, the most recent photograph I I saw of it, there is a palm tree growing up into the air, and the the top of the palm tree is right there by where Vince's balcony would have been. Oh, okay. Well, that'll make it easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's in the center of the building. Well, I flew the drone up this time. Oh, good. Yeah. So I got right up to good. it. Yeah. I might go, I might have to go back down there again because maybe I, when you show me, I might've got the wrong one. This know? is, this just popped into my mind. But um, when I was with NBC and living in that building, I was actually almost killed. Really? Um, there was a guy, a drunk guy in the Benihana of Tokyo in, uh, in uh, Torrance. And he was, um, you know how you sit around a big table at Benihana of Tokyo? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was sitting there with my girlfriend and he started cat calling my girlfriend. And I got up and walked over to him and said, if you don't stop, I'm going to have the, uh, the managers throw you out. Mm -hmm. And he came up from the table and uppercut me. Mm -hmm. And I hit my head on the table as I went down and was unconscious. And he started jumping up and down on my head. And I had to have my uh, uh, my cheekbone uh, yeah. repaired. And uh, he <laughs> almost tore my right ear off. Who's this? Uh, this was just some knucklehead drunk in uh, in, oh, in Benihana, Tokyo. This is when I was anchoring the news at NBC. I had to. I was off the air for like six months. I yeah. got plastic surgery and the whole thing. So that the something about that building, the <laughs> Delphi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shit. <laughs> just that just occurred to me. I was talking yeah. about China and Vince and yeah. it was me too. Maybe I'll have to look a little deeper into the Delphi and let you know Maybe what it's else. It's on is an Indian burial site. <laughs> built on an Indian burial ground right. or something. Yeah, I'll I'll find out. I bet you there's a lot of history there. It sounds yeah. I mean that's already three, you know, big things. <laughs> yes. So, Isn't that something? I, yeah. it, just, it just came into my head right now. It's one of those things. One of those things in my past I'd like to forget. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. Thank you so much for. You're welcome. I got got a lot of uh, of um, updating for everybody.